I'm Nicolas Tranger. I work at Scality as a principal architect, um, and I'm mainly heading our efforts on next generation technologies. So back in 2015, I believe, uh, we extended Ring, the Ring product, with a new S3 compatible object storage interface. It was not our first S3 compatible storage interface. We had another one before, but it was much more extensive. Uh, it implements things like the IAM APIs. Uh, it's more efficient than the old one. And this was primarily developed using Node.js, so running into these modern environment packaging issues. As a result, back then we decided to build S3C, the S3 connector, Scality Ring S3 connector, uh, using Docker style containers, um, and actually use Docker to deploy this on the various nodes that make up a cluster. Um, and, and so we use containers to tackle this packaging issue. Uh, which completely decouples um, the service environment to the environment in which the services that make up the S3 connector from the host operating system. We don't conflict with whatever the customer may have installed in his operating system, etc. Now, these containers, again, we're thinking 2015, 2016, were deployed in somewhat of a static way. We're not using any kind of um, container orchestration system. No, we are deploying these as if we were deploying standard operating system packages. We say this particular service or this set of containers needs to run on this particular server. These containers need to run on these servers. We deploy them there. We set up the system such that it will start them when, when the server boots. But that's about it. There is no dynamic rescheduling of containers of workloads across the various nodes that make up the environment. Then back in 2018, we launched a new product called Zenko. And this is where our learnings about cloud native um, software and deployment and Kubernetes comes in. So Zenko was a brand new product. It was from the start cloud native, really built both for the cloud as well as running in the cloud and on premises. And we'll go into that in a minute as well. It's fully container based. It's actually sharing parts of the technology that make up the S3 connector as well. And the architecture is it's microservice style. Uh, from the beginning, we decided to embrace Kubernetes and all the benefits it brings to a distributed system um, to deploy Zenko on cloud or on premises. Now, what is Zenko? And this is um, the cloud native data management days. So uh, Zenko is an open source hybrid and multi-cloud data controller for the management of active workflows on unstructured data. That's a lot of words. I'll just quickly go into some of the use cases that Zenko caters for. What is the current state of affairs or the current the state of affairs back in 2018? But I think we can say that it's still the case today. Um, there's multiple types of data. You have file data, you have object data. There's, of course, also block storage, but that is not really an area where Scality plays. Um, there are many data locations which can either be um, physical locations or like you have a data center somewhere in Asia, a data center somewhere in Europe, a data center somewhere in the US. Um, you have multiple storage platforms, both legacy ones as well as modern ones. You may have some um, SAN or NAS that still sits around from the beginning of the, of the years 2000, and you are using some really modern state-of-the-art NVMe-based storage system at the same time. And then last but not least, um, storage can be both on-premises as well as in the cloud. Uh, I think all of us, we know about the various cloud offerings and the storage ser uh, services that come with it. So some of the problems we observed were that you really lose or, or well, you don't have any visibility into the global data. There's a lot of data, you know, you're paying it for it every single month, but you don't really have visibility in, in that data that sits in various silos. Um, the silos themselves, they're both a business issue as well as a technical issue. Every single one of them needs to be maintained, upgraded, um, managed, backed up potentially. Uh, but there's also a business issue because all those silos gathering information out of all the data that sits in these various storage systems is really, really tricky. Um, it's kind of difficult to create data workflows that cross those various silos, especially when you go hybrid, which means on-premises combined with cloud environments, or multi-cloud, which means you're using multiple cloud providers uh, at the same time, uh, because all of those, they have their own APIs, um, their own way of doing things, or they don't even have any API whatsoever. Um, so building data workflows can be very, very tricky. Um, it's 
rather difficult hence to um, build applications that leverage the data from those multiple silos because your one application would need to talk to various systems using different protocols etc cetera, etc cetera. there is also no unif unified access control no unified um, authorization model and finally there is a vendor lock-in um, data is the, the, the one of the most important assets many of many uh, companies have nowadays and if you're locked in in a particular vendor you can only write applications targeting that particular vendor you really um, you, you don't really have the freedom anymore to move your data elsewhere so what Zenko brings is storage agnostic data management uh, we give you a single interface for data control across legacy hybrid and multi-cloud storage architectures which can be on-prem or in the cloud uh, we bring you, or we aim to bring you, faster application development, visibility in your global data set uh, through, for example, global search across those multiple, the data stored in these multiple silos. We give you unified uh, data governance, uh, mobility of data. You can really move data from one system to another quite easily. Um, all of this using programmatic APIs, so you can um, include this in, with either your application or other workflow systems you already have in place or through a fully graphical user interface for end users. And of course, we aim not to bring any vendor lock-in, which is one of the reasons why Zenko itself is a fully open source product that you can, a project that you can find on our GitHub. Some of the core architectural pillars of Zenko are, um, we give a unified interface across clouds. The interface itself, next to the, the graphical user interface, is S3. So all data operations you perform uh, towards Zenko, which is not storing the data itself, but gives you access to that data, is always using S3 or Azure Blob. Uh, we keep the native cloud data format, which means that we're not some gateway that takes your data and then mangles it a bit and then puts it in the cloud as an object, but you can't really retrieve it from that cloud location as the, as the original object. Um, which has one major benefit being that many of the um, cloud provided managed services, for example, related to machine learning, um, data transcoding, um, whatnot, they can work directly on data that has been put in those locations by Zenko. There is no layer in between. Um, we bring you metadata search and all operations on your data, like policies around data management, are based on search queries, kind of, um, on the metadata that comes with your object, where metadata can both be um, system metadata, like when was the object created, the MIME type, and some others, or user-provided or application-provided metadata tags, think key value pairs, that you either provide with the object when you created it in the first place, or that you add to an object later. Some of the use cases, I'm not going to details here, but the, the core ones we identified are cloud disaster recovery and high availability for the data. Um, as an example, you can make sure that any, ob any object storage you have on premises get asynchronously copied into a cloud environment. And then if you design your application such that you can easily move the application from on-premises servers into VMs, for example, in EC2, or in a hosted Kubernetes cluster, then you, you can have close to zero business, in, um, business continuity impact. Um, Zenko works really well in an edge or IoT to cloud environment as well, where you have Zenkos sitting in various locations. They get ingest from IoT devices, sensors in a plant, for example, and then all that data gets uh, copied, copied, transferred by Zenko into a cloud environment or a core data center. Many of our customers use Zenko for cloud media workflows. So you have media workflows with on-premises uh, editing and then in the cloud uh, transcoding, for example. Um, and Zenko really plays a role there to make sure that all data goes, flows throughout various pipelines to then eventually, for example, end up in a, in a CDN, a content distribution network, which go to the multi-site content distribution as well, can either be to bring data close to um, the customers or it can, for example, also be to, um, if you have various people across the globe working on a particular piece of data in their, um, in their respective time zones, then Zenko can make sure that the data gets transferred 
to the, the right location such that everyone has access to local copies of the data um, during the working hours. So, some experiences and learnings we had with building Zenko um, for Kubernetes and deploying Zenko on Kubernetes, where this deployment can be both in the cloud, like in a managed Kubernetes environment, or on-premises, for which we actually built our own distribution of Kubernetes for a couple of reasons. First, and I can really go through this quite quickly because in the end, this is related to KubeCon, so I assume most of us have a solid understanding of Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes can be seen as an operating system for clusters. So an operating system sits on, on, on your host, it's like Linux. Um, but Kubernetes makes sure that many systems, multiple servers, can work together to serve a particular workload. And what it does, in essence, is to schedule a bunch of pods. Think of it as containers, it's not exactly the same thing. Um, but it, it, man it, it schedules pods, containers that you want to run across the nodes that make up the cluster. Um, it is responsible to manage access to scarce resources that sit in a node. Trivial examples there are CPU and memory, um, but there can also be more, more um, specific um, hardware available in various nodes. Think GPUs, think TPUs, think very specific storage uh, systems like Intel Optane, um, where then Kubernetes can make sure that these devices are exposed to the containers where your application runs and which can then con consume that hardware. Finally, and this is important for us, Kubernetes can also be used to manage access to local storage. Local storage, think, um, hard drives, SSDs, NVMEs sitting in a physical machine. Then next to all of that, so access to resources, Kubernetes being an operating system, kind of, is also responsible to um, connect your applications, your containers to the outside. This can go in two ways. You have networking through the CNI plugins that Kubernetes uses and to storage through the CSI plugins that Kubernetes uses, where this storage is most often not local, but is some external SAM or NAS-based storage system uh, where volumes can be provisioned, can be attached to a, to a node, can be mounted inside a container and then used by your application. Um, this is how we see Kubernetes and its architecture. And, and this may be, um, not everyone may agree with it, but we see that Kubernetes itself at its core is very consistent. It is always the same paradigm that gets used of you model something, you, you have controllers which refine the models into lower level models, you then finally realize these lower level models um, into actual real world things, like running an actual container somewhere. Uh, and this kind of turns it into something simple, which doesn't mean that Kubernetes itself is simple at all. And definitely operating it, running it um, in the long term is not simple, but architecturally it kind of is. As, managed, uh, as mentioned before, at its core, Kubernetes is a declar declarative model of which ob objects get stored in a highly available data store um, at CD. And then you have these control loops that refine objects into lower level ones. Think of a deployment object that gets refined into um, a replica set object. And then you have another controller that turns a replica set into a set of pods that need to be eventually scheduled on various nodes. Um, and then you have Kubelet, which is an agent sitting on all the servers, which runs the containers through another interface called CRI. Think of uh, Container D, Cryo, and even Docker as potential implementations of CRI. And QProxy, which is responsible for setting up the um, cert cluster IP um, networking. Um, so basically providing access from one pod to another through a kind of a virtual IP and ensure that load is balanced across multiple pods that implement one service. Um, from our experience, Kubernetes' architecture is really solid and the implementation itself is really high quality. We did run into bugs and issues, um, but the community is really good at um, figuring out what the actual bug is, finding a solution, implementing a solution. And if, as a vendor, um, you implement uh, fixes as well, it's, 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 really use, uh, it's really simple to get them upstreamed, even though sometimes it can take a while before your bug fix gets merged. 
Um, so taking Kubernetes from upstream to production. Plain Kubernetes, Kubernetes core, so you want, is useful for development, but it's not ready for, for enterprise-grade production deployments. Uh, you need things like monitoring, log management, authentication, authorization. Uh, you need an ingress controller. You may need load balancing. Um, and where Kubernetes originally was really built for, for cloud-style environments where everything is available as a service, be it a load balancer, be it storage, uh, be it even new, phys new virtual machines, um, it, 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 it doesn't really fit with our use cases of Scality being a product for enterprise-ready storage. It's on-premises, various uh, security um, restrictions. We require offline delivery and installation because our customers have deconnected or not connected to the internet um, data centers. There is no such thing as a disk as a service. You can't just say, hey, give me a disk, and then magically a disk um, is built out of thin air. Uh, so we must have really good support for local drives. We need integration with existing networks, with user directories and whatnot. So we build the so-called Metal Case or Metal Kubernetes project. Um, Metal Case itself is also um, fully open source. You can use it to deploy a Kubernetes cluster, what we think is uh, an enterprise-grade production-ready Kubernetes cluster in your own environment. So make sure to also check it out on our GitHub. One last point on uh, cloud-native storage. So Scality itself, is now bringing you cloud native storage in, in, in two, in, in two di dimensions. One being um, Scality can be deployed on, or part of the, 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 the Scality offering can be deployed on Kubernetes. And here we always use operators. What is an operator? It's kind of like a codified operations manual. If, if, if Before you have an operations manual which says, when this happens, you have to do this, check this, do this, check that. Um, we can now codify this. This has been done in the past, of course, to a certain degree. Um, but we can really bring these operations as software, uh, which runs in your cluster and can then manage the lifecycle of the software, reconfiguration of the software, and in essence, always act on events, where an event can be create a new instance of my software, upgrade the software, reconfigure the software, or even an operator can observe that a particular pod, a container, is crashing for some reason and then take appropriate actions to make sure that the, the root cause of that issue gets fixed automatically without any human operator um, performing any action. This is one aspect, so installing Scality storage on Kubernetes. There is also another aspect, which is about consuming Scality storage for or in Kubernetes. Uh, of course, you can consume uh, the Scality object storage from any workload running anywhere, be it on physical machines, be it on virtual machines in your environment, etc. But of course, also from Kubernetes. And then in Kubernetes, we have this technology called CSI, which allows you to set up block or file storage with your application. You basically say, here is an application. I want to get a 500 terabyte um, file uh, volume with it. CSI will make sure that the two get that the volume gets connected. The application gets connected to um, the volume, can then use it for storage, and you're done. Uh, there's, an, there's also an, another specification the Kubernetes community is, is working on and we're very actively contributing to, which is called COSI. It's a bit like CSI, but it's not for block or file storage. It is for object storage. So COSI stands for the Container Object Storage Interface. It does not give a new API to access the storage. It's really meant to work with any existing S3 or Azure Blob uh, or other supported protocols um, application, but it is to provision, to create um, buckets, to create access credentials to buckets and expose those credentials and endpoint information and whatever else your application needs into um, containers such that the application can then use the object storage bucket. Cozy itself is very much work in progress at the time I'm recording this, um, but we're very actively working with the community to get to get this done, um, and, and there's already many vendors. It's, it's a cross-vendor um, effort. We're working together to, to, to really make object storage provisioning part of your Kubernetes-style application uh, deployment and lifecycle, similar to what CSI has done for file and block. That was it. Thanks for your attention. And if there's any questions, just shoot me an email and make sure to reach out on GitHub, uh, both for Zenko as well as the Metal Cage project and many other projects that Scality has open sourced. Thank you.